comment about that little switch. I had the same conversation with one of my neighbors and I was shocked to see that there was a switch that they could put it to one, two or three. Three very loud, one very quiet. Um, can understand why aftermarket they're available. Um, is it possible that when the police and our bylaw enforcement are meeting and having discussions about that, they can look into these switches and see whether or not there's something that the municipality can say, no, you can't activate them within our um, geographical boundaries. So I'll just leave that as an open-ended question to okay. our staff to, to address, but this is an excellent motion. Congratulations, Councilor Jackson. I knew you were working on it. I was very glad to see it come forward and I fully support it. Thank you. And Ken, uh, you, I think you heard the question, so maybe uh, you know an answer at some point whether that uh, regulation could be put in place in terms of the switches on those vehicles. Councilor Nan. Thank you, through the mayor. Thank you. I will add, uh, echo the chorus in support of um, Councilor Jackson's motion that we're all deliberating right now. Definitely uh, an issue in, in Ward 3 as well. And uh, some people have mentioned not only is it an issue from a health and safety perspective in terms of noise, but it's also a health and safety uh, issue as it relates to pollution. Many of the modified mufflers uh, render the vehicles not able to do what a muffler is supposed to do and therefore cause more pollutants into the air and uh, particularly impacting those who are smaller and children, um, the level of exposure to the air pollution. Uh, not only is it addressing toxic air, it's also addressing toxic masculinity. Uh, so I'll be happily supporting the motion. Thank you. Yeah, who's, what was the other one? Yeah. Knuckle Knuckleheads heads. and toxic masculinity and uh, inadequacies on behalf of some of the drivers out there, according to Coast of Fars. Or, uh, let's carry on. I, I, this is getting interesting. Councillor Vanderbeek. Go ahead. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'm not going to say everything everyone else has said. Thank you, Tom, uh, Councillor Jackson. Um, this is a this is a this is a, a motion that has needed to come forward for a long time, and I absolutely applaud you, and I will absolutely support it. Um, I was going to ask the question too about whether or not there was a way to um, have some jurisdiction over whether or not these uh, these switches are allowed. And so I'm glad that that question was asked. Anyway, I will be supporting this. It's um, been a long time coming. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And you know what, particularly noisy in that uh, little stretch in Dundas from, it, it's a, it's like an echo chamber in there. And I, every time I go there, it's, it's, it's noisy no matter what. And then you bring one of those vehicles in there, it is just uh, amplified ten, tenfold. So another area that is of concern for sure. So we have the motion on the floor, moved by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Collins, uh, supported by everyone that I've heard of so far. So let's go to a vote. All those in favor of Councillor Jackson's muffler, anti-loud muffler motion. And I'm gonna project unanimous support, Councillor Jackson. Anyone need to, uh, oh, everyone's in, that's great. Marvelous, thank you so very much. Uh, unanimously supported for all that are present, thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor Jackson, good work. I'm going to turn to item uh, 6.3, uh, which is the Central Composting Facility Request for Proposal Options, referred from Public Works to this Council meeting today. And we have a motion by Councillor Pearson. Mm -hmm. Councillor Pearson, you want to lead it yep. off? I will, Mr. Mayor, and you'll recall that this was uh, referred from, um, I believe, Public Works meeting. So it's moved by myself, and if I can, I'm sure Councillor Danko, if I can ask for his seconding on this. It's uh, the Central Composting Facility Request for Proposal Option Citywide referred to Council by Public Works Committee at its meeting of October 17, 2020, whereas the current contract for the operation and maintenance of the City of Hamilton Central Composting Facility commenced in June 2006 whereas the current operation and maintenance contract for the central composting facility will expire December 31st, 2020, whereas staff were authorized and directed to prepare and issue a request for proposal C110920 for the operation and maintenance of the central composting facility under the same terms and conditions of the current contract, whereas staff were directed to prepare and submit an in-house bid 
whereas a request for proposal C110920 was issued on May 25th, 2020, and is set to close July 20th, 2020, whereas staff received a request from the, uh, a proponent to include offsite third-party processing for organic material collected through the Green Bin Program as an alternative proposal to, to request for proposal C110920, and whereas a further option for the operation and maintenance of the central composting facility can be considered. However, it would be a material change to recently issued request for proposal C110920. Therefore, be it resolved that staff be directed to cancel the request for proposal C110920, operation and maintenance of the central composting facility, and B, that staff modify the request for proposal C110920, operation and maintenance of the central composting facility, to include the option for off-site third-party processing of organic waste collection, collected through the green bin program while operating the central composting facility as a transfer station, and see that staff reissued the request for proposal C110920 to obtain proposals for both the operations and maintenance of the central composting facility and off-site third-party processing of organic material. D, that staff be still prepare and submit an in-house bid for the operation and maintenance of the central composting facility, E, these are the amendments that staff be directed to conduct a risk assessment of contracted operations and maintenance of the central composting facility versus third-party off-site processing versus in-house operations and maintenance of the central composting facility. F, again, amendment that staff report back to the Public Works Committee with recommendations based on the results of the risk assessment and both the in-house bid and external bids, contracted operations and maintenance for, of the central composting facility and third-party offsite processing received in response to the RFP and G that staff be directed to enter into negotiations with Maple Rinders Constructors Limited for the purpose of extending the current contract C11105-03 C11 for the operations and maintenance of the central composting facility for a time period of up to six months to allow for the reissuing of RFP C110920. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay. And I, uh, if you want me to just comment, so I think the, the concerns that were raised at the meeting have been incorporated into this motion now, and um, this just would allow staff to move ahead and allow for this bid process to begin again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have uh, Councillors Ferguson, uh, myself, but I'll go at the end, Councillor Marula. Go ahead, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple questions for Craig Murdoch. I see he's on the air. Mm -hmm. um, so, Craig, two questions. Uh, can, if, if we go with an offsite option and it's low bidder, can we award to a second bidder if we don't like the location? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe what you're asking is, do we have the right to not award to the lowest bidder, regardless of the option? It is, although we we tested that before and haven't done a very good job on it. I just want to make sure the RFP is very clear that um, that we reserve the right to not award to an offsite option location if in fact, is deemed to be an, uh, unacceptable. I, I understand from my conversation with you earlier in the week that um, procurement and legal won't allow you to disclose who the bidder is and where the location is. But I think we need comfort that it won't be uh, located in the Ancaster Industrial Park, as an example. Um, I know the zoning isn't right for that, so I'm being facetious. But if we don't like the location where the offsite look, um, plant is located, we can reject that offer and go to the next bidder. Is that abundantly clear in the RFP, Craig? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it's not in the current uh, RFP because the current RFP doesn't contemplate third-party offsite processing. But the front end of the document does state that the council has the right not to award to the lowest bidder. Now, okay, uh, but we've never, been, we've never been successful on those, so in defending that. and and. You, I know the, the current RFP doesn't <laughs> specifically lay that out, but when you reissue it, will that be made abundantly clear? Uh, Tina Ayako and Susan Nicholson from Legal Services is online, so maybe I could hand it over to one of them to answer your question. Okay. Tina or Susan, I heard. Tina? Uh, through the mayor, uh, good afternoon. The um, Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the RFP, because it is an RFP, uh, and we've included language in the document to allow council to choose whichever um, option is best for the city. And if it's not necessarily the lowest one for whatever reason, council has that full discretion. So this particular RFP and the other waste collection and other environmental uh, waste RFPs that we have issued has similar language in order to do that. Thank you. So it's not simply uh, the front of the tender saying lowest or any tender not necessarily accepted. Uh, I, th I think I'd like to make sure it's clear because I don't want legal to fight us on this later. That uh, if an off-site location is low bid and we don't like the location, we have the right to reject it. So Tina? through the mayor, the, this is an RFP, a request for proposals, not a request for tenders document. So a request for tenders document is always awarded to the low bidder. Uh, request for proposals is always awarded according to the evaluation criteria in the document and not necessarily is not always going to low bidder. So you don't want to make it explicitly clear in the RFP then that if we don't like the outside location, we reserve the right to reject it. Um, yeah. Through the mayor, we could put language in there to include that it's council's preference that a location for offsite be uh, outside the city or in some areas or industrial uh, areas within the city. But I would caution by putting a reverse, almost a reverse local preference language in the document to that effect. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you need to say uh, we prefer uh, using our own facility. You know, if it's going to an established uh, recycling or composting facility outside the city limits, we probably won't have too much of a problem with that. But if it's going in a residential area in Hamilton, we'll have a problem with it. And so I just want to make sure we'll have the right to reject any tender that provides a site that's unacceptable to council. Through the mayor, we can make sure and speak with legal to make sure that the language that we have, if it's not uh, adequate, we can uh, um, do whatever we need to do to bump it up to that effect. Yeah. Okay, I just don't want procurement and legal to say you can't do that after it's closed. <laughs> and uh, I want to be abundantly clear with you on that. Right. Yes, so I think she made, a, she made a distinction between an RFP and a tender. I know. I think it gives <laughs> us more discretion. Well, uh, okay. But I know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. So I, I think we've got acknowledgement that they're going to try and beef up the language. So maybe uh, we'll, we'll, we need to yeah. kind of look at it before try. it goes out. I, I heard they will do it. Will, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And the second question I had is that the, the documents are also abundantly clear because legal pushes back on this when we want to do it. That we have the right to bring it in house if if our costs are lower. I'll start with Craig on that. Okay, great. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, the current RFP has that language, and it will be in the uh, amended RFP if approved by council. Um, but I do want to point out that it doesn't necessarily have to be lower for a council to award it to an in-house bidder. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, my concern is that if we do shut down our own facility in five years time, we, we've seen a significant lack of competition on our waste projects, whether it was the MRF or the, the curbside collection. And in five years time, they, we have more consolidation and there's really only one or two players out there. And we've cannibalized where we shut down our composting facility for five years, probably will have cannibalized it by then. It's going to be very difficult to start it back up. And you know, if you don't use a facility, it tends to seize up, and and uh, and a lot of mechanical items will will fail. And uh, but on the other hand, we need more competition. And uh, so I would like to. I think if there's an offsite option and there's a competitor out there that has a location that's up and running, um, maybe that'll be an incentive for our current operator or others who are going to use our facility to sharpen their pencil a bit. So I've now got comfortable with the resolution with those two qualifications that uh, procurement and and um, and Craig have confirmed that we're okay on, which is we don't have to award it to the outside person even if they're low, if we don't like the location. And secondly, that we can bring it in house if we want to without any legal pushback, if you will. So I'm prepared Great. to support the motions before us now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Council Marula. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. And just uh, just quickly, my my involvement in this uh, initiative 
was twofold. One being that I believe it should be within the public hands and controlled by uh, a public entity, being the city of Hamilton. Secondly, um, I'd argue that it is presently in a residential area, hence the reason why I brought forward a motion that we look at not only taking it in house, but actually looking for a new location outside. Uh, um, things have changed since 2006, but in 2006, I did warn everyone that it could potentially be problematic. Today, however, uh, it's even more problematic because of the rise in property values. So the average house in 2006 in Hamilton was probably about 200,000. It's now close to 600,000. Hence, we, we have homes now, people moving in from outside of Hamilton that live literally within 500 meters of that industrial core. In 2006, when those homes were being sold for 50,000 or 80,000, um, and, I, and I, I was hearing their voices, but they weren't as loud as they are today. Um, and council didn't react to those voices, but I did. And that's why I never supported it. But today they're far greater in numbers and they're more engaged in, in the political process. So in, in 2015, I believe, or 16, we, we had a fallout, a, a quite significant one where quality of life was impaired throughout the lower city and it traveled all the way to the east, even central mountain. Um, so I, I'd argue that presently it is in a residential area. So we do need to find a new location, number one. Number two, we do need to be in full operation and control of it because when we sign off on the control, we have learned that it's been an experiment gone awry that has cost us more, not less, because it's either paid now or pay later. And every single time it, we take the bait because the number's so low at the front end, by the time you evaluate the cost at the end of it, we, we would have been better off just keeping it in house. So the whole thing's been a total farce from day one, this whole public private, par, private public partnership that I've uh, never supported when it came to essential services such as this. Um, so I, 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 I'm glad that we're moving forward. Uh, but keep in mind, it is presently impacting a large residential area, tens of thousands of people, actually one of the most concentrated areas of population in the entire city. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate what's before us. And I look forward to a, an end result that would be in the best interest of every resident of the city. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you uh, for those comments. Councillor Collins, you're up next. Ow. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I share similar concerns to Councillor Marula, and I and I think he raised a great point, and it's always been our concern related to waste disposal facilities, and that is the not just residents, but the businesses that are located around it. And um, I think what we learned over time, whether it was Swaru or other waste operations, whether they were private or public, there's always an impact. And my concern that I raised at the committee was around one issue, and I didn't get into the planning part of it, but I'm going to raise it now because I do have some questions. So my concern was, uh, you know, there's only four or five areas within the city that can accommodate a waste disposal facility from a planning perspective. So for as much as we have business parks, many of the new modern business parks do not uh, facilitate or would accommodate a, a waste application, such as the one that we're entertaining here. Uh, and so that leaves us with the lower city area where it's still primarily uh, the old K zoning, which is new designation now, but it's heavy industry. And one of those areas is uh, just off Centennial Parkway. And so, you know, one of the few uh, issues that we benefited from under the wind government was the investment that they made in the in the GO station on Centennial Parkway. It is directly adjacent to our existing transfer station. And all of the lands surrounding Centennial Parkway are um, are zoned for or, or could be uh, uh, could accommodate or, or, re, or house a waste facility, uh, a compost facility. So my concern is, and, and coincidentally now planning staff have just sent me a note that there is an, a, a new application that's come through for a waste facility operation on Kenora, uh, very close to where we have our transit, our transfer station. And so we we receive a tremendous investment from the pr provincial government. We all know what happens around GO stations across the province as it relates to growth and investment. Investors are clamoring to get as close to these um, interregional uh, transportation facilities as possible. Uh, we, as soon as that investment was made here, we undertook a secondary planning process to change the vintage 1970s zoning along Centennial, specifically between Barton and the QEW, 
to accommodate the future growth and demand that will come when that station is fully operational and is providing full-time service to this community. All of those lands in that stretch that I just referenced there have been designated for high density residential. And for me, whether it's 20 stories, 25 stories or up, um, I'm completely supportive of those investments being made, just makes all the sense in the world with everything that's going on in, in the Golden Horseshoe. So during that process, and we spent a lot of time and resources on that secondary planning process, I raised the issue that we are now encouraging people to build residential next to our own waste facility uh, station. Fairly tough to get the planning approvals for residential adjacent to the zoning that is all along Centennial there. And fairly tough to sell a condominium unit when someone's looking at um, you know heavy vehicles moving piles of garbage with a thousand seagulls flying around. So that's what we're up against right now. Uh, council was kind enough to include in the secondary planning process uh, two things. One, the investigation of us moving our transfer station to a more appropriate location now based on the investments that have been made with the GO station. Two, we were going to look at revising all of the industrial zoning in that, that stretch there um, to ensure that when we undertake our industrial land supply review that we look at taking some of that out or modifying it so that when a, when a an investor comes to, to that area and says, I want to build a 20 story condo. There aren't all kinds of hoops and hurdles that they have to go through in order to make that happen. So it needs to be seamless. It, it needs, we need to be accommodating. And the only way for that to happen is through a proper planning process. So here we are today, we're entertaining a facility that could be um, located in that area. I just referenced the, uh, the note that I got from planning to say that there is an application now on Kenora. I don't know if it's related or not. That has that connection hasn't been made. But I raise it as a concern that all of these investments have been made, not just by council, but specifically by the province. And we're on the verge of possibly making a decision that could impact those investments. So my request um, since the committee meeting to staff was, is there a way to exclude within a certain proximity of the GO station, any type of operation that would allow a compost facility or waste transfer station or whatever you wanna call it in the future. And I think there was some some issues with putting that in there because of the tender process and procurement and, and what kind of language we could add. So I have not been assured that, that those investments will be protected through this. If staff have a mechanism in which we can ensure that we don't find ourselves contemplating a facility, a hop, skip and a jump away from the, the new GO station, I'm willing to entertain, um, as Councillor Marula said, I'm willing to, to look at what comes back but there's nothing in this document right now that says that someone, that an entity, a business entity, cannot set up operation in that area there. It's permitted. And, and so the risk that we run through this process is that, and it might be lottery odds that it happens, but the risk we run is that someone comes back with an ap application and a cost structure that is appealing, and then we have to choose. We have to choose between low cost contract versus the opportunities that will come over the next five, 10, 20 years in that area which is something from a sustainable development perspective makes all the sense in the world from a, from a planning perspective. And that's why we did the secondary plan. So I'm sorry to go on there in terms of con contextualizing it, but I think it's important to know what we're up against in that little area there. And if someone can give me some assurance that that won't happen through this process, then I'm, I'm certainly open. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there uh, anyone that can give any kind of assurance that that won't happen in that area? Is this, a, is this a location where an interim control byline might be appropriate? Mr. Mayor, Greg? if I may uh, jump in. Yep. Um, the, the one thing that I would say is that the, this contract is uh, up at the end of this year. Uh, for any proponent to be successful here, they would, uh, if they were putting forward some kind of a scheme whereby they were gonna build something, they'd never get it done uh, in time for uh, assuming the contract by the end of the year. So I, I think I can, uh, Craig and I can work with Tina um, to possibly construct language in the RFP to make sure that it's a, anything that we would consider would have to be an ongoing uh, enterprise already, uh, unless somebody had a secret C of A on one of those properties that, that uh, none of us knew about. Um, I guess that would be the only risk associated with that. But for somebody to reply to our RFP, uh, with a proposal of building something, the, the timing just wouldn't work out for them. Are we aware, Dan, of what, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, are we aware of what inventory there is in that area? Because 
I know that in the early 2000s and into 2010, we had a pelletization plant there, which again dealt with waste. I, I believe there might be a couple of private operations that have a certificate or whatever the new name is now that's been uh, um, provided by the ministry. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm not sure if we can ascertain that, but we can certainly take that away to see if, if that is uh, something we can determine whether or not uh, we can see any existing C of A's or ECA's that exist on any of the properties down there. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, uh, I see no further speakers <laughs> other than myself. So, so uh, a quick question for me is I wasn't at Public Works, obviously, and uh, I'm curious if the proponent that's proposing uh, the offsite uh, composting site is a proponent that's already bidding on the process. Is that is that uh, someone that's being introduced new, or is that someone that's actively participating in it already, but offering up a different different option, right? Uh, Mr. Mayor, as far as I understand, they are a company that already provides composting services. I don't know where they're located and I don't know their name. I don't know if there's anything that Tina can provide in that regard. Um, but I understand that they are a, an RFP taker. Like they, they did pick up an RFP from the city of Hamilton in order to uh, evaluate it and see if it was something that they could bid on. So they're already a potential bidder in this process. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, that is correct. So we're we're not we're not. <laughs> I guess my my worry is we're 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 into a procurement or or a RFP process. Uh, we're not introducing somebody new that then has caused us to cancel what we're doing and kind of go on to a different track. So this is not what's happening. This proponent has already been uh, indicating a, that they were going to participate in the RFP process as it is, or as it was, I guess. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, that is my understanding. They have the option of bidding on it as status quo, which is operating our facility. So as part of their um, preparation for this, they've asked the question, would we entertain um, them being able to put in an alternative bid to process at a off-site third-party location? And is there is there nothing in our... I guess it's, it gets a little dicey because it all, almost becomes a legal issue at uh, at some point. Uh, is there is there not a good reason for us to have prior to them getting you know our, our altering our procurement process, having an understanding of where their site and location might be? Is that not a reasonable question for the city to ask before we get onto a different track? And that maybe not through you, Craig, so much as through uh, through Tina. I, I'll let Tina speak to it in a second, but I just want to point out that just because one company has asked, it doesn't mean that other companies wouldn't bid. So if we understand where this one loca company is located or where the third-party processing facility is located, it wouldn't prevent other companies from bidding that have not asked the question. Fair enough. So maybe with that, I'll hand it over to Tina. Okay. Thank you, Tina. Uh, so, um, Mayor, um, we cannot ask any proponents who have picked up the documents or have secured the documents any particular questions regarding their proposal. Um, we don't have those conversations before the uh, proposal or the RFP is closed. Sometimes in the RFP, we allow for what's called commercially confidential meetings, but this RFP did not did not allow us to do that. So we cannot look behind what the proponent is interested in proposing at all. So to answer your question, no, that's not, we're not able to do that. And well, have, I, have, so haven't we already done that though? Because this proponent has come forward and said, uh, I, I got an alternative that isn't part of your RFP process. So we've already kind of looked through the door and someone's already put on the table some alternative that indicates something different than what we started out with in terms of the existing facility. So haven't we already opened that door? Well, I believe that we haven't looked too far behind it, if you will. So the door <laughs> is open um, and it's an opportunity to look at another uh, way of, of finding a solution for this problem, if you will. So it's another option on the table for council. Um, and that's the, the motion in front of, of council today is to cancel the current RFP that we have on the street 
to uh, reconfigure it to allow for this um, secondary option, if you will, possibly add some additional um, evaluation criteria, some performance standards, if you will, and then reissue the RFP to allow for that um, extra third option, if you will. So uh, we cannot engage in any in-depth discussions with the with the proponent. I'm of the understanding that we have not had any uh, in-depth discussions with this proponent. So we haven't broken our own rules in that respect, um, but we cannot simply call up the phone and ask them where they're intending on putting their third party processing and, and any information behind it at this time. Okay, so so uh, that leads me to the question of how did we get here in the first place? So somebody must have approached someone and said, we have an alternative that we wanna bring forward. Yes, so- did that, did that come through staff? Did it come through legal, through procurement? How did that happen? So to my knowledge, uh, through the mayor, um, when we were in a uh, procurement process, the any uh, the plant takers and in, I believe this individual did pick up a document, so they are registered as a plant taker on the bids and tenders website, and through that website they have the opportunity to submit questions to the procurement staff with regards to the RFP, and that's how this precipitated. Okay. So it was a question that was posed to staff. All right, thank you, and then so and then to to you then, Craig. Thank you, Tina. You're, you're, you're supportive of this direction, Greg, in terms of moving, canceling the previous procurement process and then introducing this other alternative that everyone I saw, who picks up a package, I assume, can can bid on as they as they so choose. You, you support that direction? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's not that I support or not support a direction in this case. It was just to make sure that council had all of the available options in front of them. Given that the last few contracts that we have had come forward for waste have come in over budget, and that's caused concern for council, um, this is an opportunity potentially, I'm not saying it would, but I'm saying it's potentially to um, maybe come in on budget or under budget. We don't know what it will be if we don't ask the question. So all we're doing is saying to council, this is an option because if we keep things the way they are now and they come in over budget, we could be asked the question, well, what could you do to save money? Because that's the question that has been asked on the last two contracts that we've awarded. Fair enough, fair enough. But so you're, you, you, you do support this direction though in terms of providing options for council at the end of the day. I definitely support providing okay. options to council. All yes. right, appreciate that. Thank you. Council Clark, you're up next. Can I asked the, the question, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I ask the question, um, do we know, does anybody know the locations of these third party offsite facilities? Greg? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we do know of some facilities in Ontario that are their common knowledge. You know, we know that there's one in Ottawa. We know there's one in London. We know there's a couple in Toronto. There's one in Arthur. There's one in Niagara region. Um, so we know of the big players and the large facilities. Mr. Clark. Okay. And do we know whether or not this proponent is proposing to use one of those? locations away from the city of Hamilton or are they proposing a location in the city of Hamilton? Through you, Mr. Mayor, we do not know the answers to any of that. And so what control then does the city of Hamilton have on the siting of this type of facility through an RFP process? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's what Tina had mentioned earlier in answering Councillor um, Ferguson, is that we can put things in the RFP if we cancel it and modify it and reissue it. We can put um, controls in there, and it would also be part of the evaluation criteria. Uh, Tina, I don't know if you want to expand on that. So the question, Tina, is specific to us saying, no to this location. So assume hypothetically that the location is the one Councilor Collins was speaking of down on Lower Centennial Parkway close to the new GO station. Um, once we find out about the location, does the city of Hamilton have the unilateral authority 
to say, no, we're not going there. We That's not a part of our plan. Or well, once the RFPs are in, we have to make the decision based. It doesn't really matter. It's wherever the proponents are pushing to put the site. Tina? So through Mr. Mayor, um, there are a few issues here. Um, the first and foremost um, issue that council needs to be mindful of is that when we issue an RFP, we need to be completely open, fair and transparent. So if there is a desire by council not to award or uh, not to award the contract to um, a firm that's operating in any section of the city, we really should be putting that in being, putting that in the document and saying that there's a preference by council. So at least proponents know from the very beginning that if they put a proposal in for in an area that is not desirable by council, they know off the bat and it's not undisclosed criteria. The other issue is that we can put language in the document and I believe there is language now give council the absolute discretion to pick amongst the options, which one is um, in their sole discretion is the best for the city. And if that is the most expensive, or if that's uh, an option to bring it in house, that is solely within council's discretion. The other thing I need to be, we I need to be mindful of that is um, in 2012, council passed a report that said there would, we would not, um, we would refrain from local preference. And the way the council report is written is that we're not benefiting, nor are we penalizing local me. This is almost a reverse local preference. So instead of instead of giving preference to a vendor, we're almost hindering other vendors to come into Hamilton and open up their business. So I have to be mindful of that as well. But council has full discretion on um, picking whichever option is in front of them. Thank you, Council Clark. And can I hear from our city solicitor? Does she concur with that position? I'm not sure if she wants to answer that question in public. But... <laughs> I, I would have to think so. Nicole, did, uh, did you hear the question? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm, I'm actually going to see if Susan Nicholson is on the phone. She has been more involved with this particular file, so I don't want to um, you know, supersede her involvement on this. So I will turn it over to Susan. And if she has any um, follow up for me, I'm happy to make that. Okay, Susan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you and uh, further to Nicole's comment as well as Tina's, um, what I think we would like to see are certain requirements in the RFP that speak to, uh, that would be part of the evaluation. So, for instance, um, there would be very transparent and objective requirements that we could add in with respect to proximity to residential locations. Um, I think that would be a fair criteria that would be um, that could be applied in this instance. Um, there are issues with preference or reverse preference. I think um, Tina has mentioned Council's policy on that, but I think preference um, can be a troublesome issue if it appears to um, provide an opportunity for some potential proponents versus others. So I think there are other criteria that we could use that would be very objective um, that would help the focus uh, accordingly. And I, I would prefer to see it that way uh, as opposed to um, a little more open type of approach. Councilor Clark. Okay, so to, to clarify, does the council or will the council, depending on how you draft the RFP, have the unilateral decision on any potential siting of a composting facility? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I think as Mr. Murdoch has indicated, um, and, and as Tina has, um, that as an RFP, council has the ability to make the decision on the uh, option that's best for the city of Hamilton. <laughs> and I guess it's always the risk as to what the courts inter interpret it. Um, I'm, can I also ask um, for clarification with regards to the residential component? It's not just the residential component. If we have restaurants that are in close proximity to a composting facility and they have horrible odors, then that's a real challenge. I know 
up in my neck of the woods and Council Jackson's neck of the woods, from time to time, the odors coming off of of the transfer station are strong enough that you couldn't sit outside in a patio to eat your your hamburger. Um, so we need to be cognizant of that also. Um, I'm just really nervous, Mr. Mayor, in terms of losing the opportunity to control the siting of this facility. Um, so I, I have real trepidations here, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see no further speakers on this issue. I want to thank uh, all of the uh, staff speakers on this issue. And I think we'll, uh, we have the motion before us, uh, put by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Danko, if I'm correct. Councillor Danko, is that correct? Thank you. And we'll go to a vote. So all those in favor, please indicate. And those opposed? Councillor Farr, you in favor? Opposed? You got the vote? Okay, thank you. Uh, that carries in favor, uh, yes, eight to six. So thank you for that, um, Councillor Pearson. And we're gonna to turn to uh, a reconsideration of item 6-4 of the April 15th, 2020 Council Minutes respecting a report PD 2000, demolition permit for 393 Rymel Road West. Councillor Danko, do you want to introduce your notice of motion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to leave it as a notice, but uh, okay. just for Council's uh, reference, this is a, a residential property that's on the St. Elizabeth uh, Mills property that they had applied for a demolition permit for, and one of the standard um, um, contingent or parts of our, our approval is that they have to build a replacement structure and it uh, clerks caught this that the uh, proponent had requested that the replacement structure not be a requirement as this is part of the the overall redevelopment of that site which is ongoing so the reconsideration is just to um, take that uh, component out of the the building permit so that it gives them more flexibility to as they're redeveloping so it's more or less a, a bookkeeping thing uh, in keeping with the uh, the proponent's request that uh, clerks very uh, skillfully caught and brought to my attention. So thank you. Okay. So you're going to leave it as a notice of motion though? Really as a notice and we'll deal with it at our next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Item 7-2 then. City Ambassadors on the Waterfront Trail. Councillor Collins, uh, you have a motion you want to waive the rules? Yeah, I need to I need to move the wave the rules to introduce this. It is time sensitive. It's why I'm bringing it to council. Unfortunately, I I solidified the wording on this the day after our last planning committee meeting, so didn't have a chance to introduce it at, at committee. Okay. So your seconder for waving the rules would be Councillor Jackson. Thank you. Any comments or questions on waving the rules? If not, let's go to a vote. All in favor. Going to go with a wild and crazy assumption that that's going to be carried. Councillor Collins, go ahead. So I would move then, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I believe everyone has it in front of them. I'm just trying to get it here. It's essentially to hire uh, two two bylaw officers. It's it, they would be students for the summer months, and uh, I would use Councillor Jackson then as my seconder on this, if you don't okay. mind. Thank you. Let me just uh, clarify, Councillor Farr, you needed a vote on the waiving of the rules. Did you have a clerk? Councillor Clark, waiving of the rules was thumbs up, I see. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Councillor Collins, sorry. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So contextually, as we know it, the, uh, the Waterfront Trail is one of the city's uh, most well-used recreational amenities. And uh, just in speaking to staff, we're, we're at about a half a million visits a year as it relates to how many people are visiting and it can be very congested and especially during the time of the pandemic when we're seeing a lot of recreational amenities obviously close to the public including formalized sports there's there's even more traffic today than there would be under normal times so increasingly um, trail users are experiencing problems with activities that run counter to our posted rules and the etiquette that we have on our signs and in, in our parking lots 
on any given day, you'll see e-bikes, scooters, motorbikes, uh, individual cyclists, and even racing teams that are using the trail. And uh, those activities, which are contrary to our bylaws, as well as the trail etiquette, um, are causing um, safety issues for those people who are using the trail in compliance with our posted rules. And there's been conflict. There's been conflict between those people who are illegally using the trail with some of those devices and those people who are walking on the trail or who are casually cycling or who are rollerblading, as well as those people with pets. And so there have been incidents over the last number of summers where uh, people who using the trail irresponsibly have run into people, people using the trail and or have uh, had accidents with people's uh, pets who've been on their leashes. And so the trail etiquette signs that we have, um, they haven't uh, essentially worked for everyone. And um, we've updated our signs. We've had um, some sporadic bylaw visits in the past. And I think even Hamilton Police Service have been down there with the horses one summer a couple of times to try to show some presence. And unfortunately, it just hasn't worked. And so in consultation with Ken and, and uh, his staff, it looks like uh, two students on, on bikes, uh, could assist as it relates to enforcing the trail etiquette signs. And that might mean some education for those people who are unaware of what's allowed and not allowed. But more importantly, I think for those people who are thumbing their nose at those rules, it, it may mean fines and or tickets. And so I regularly receive um, complaints from my constituents and other constituents across the city. Um, asking what the city is doing to crack down on these activities. And we've had requests to put speed bumps in, to create a separate trail for cyclists, to paint a line on the trail, to put barriers up. And of course, all of those activities impact um, trail users. And um, there's a cost to that. And of course, there's some spatial constraints there. And so we're, we're also bound by the AODA uh, legislation. And so some of those items that have been passed along to us just aren't options. And so Ken has come up with this idea to have the two uh, bylaw officers on bikes through the summer months paid for out of the beach reserve. And I'm hoping that at the end of the summer, we'll, be, we'll get some kind of a summary and a synopsis in terms of um, how it's fared and, and how it's worked and what kind of activities we've put a dent in. So I'm, it's there in front of you. If I could use Councillor Jackson again as my seconder, I would, I would appreciate that. And special thanks to, uh, to Ken for assisting over the last several weeks in formulating what's in front of us. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, speakers on that, Councillors Nan and Councillors Wilson. Councillor Nan. Don't see Councillor Nan present at the moment. So let me go to Councillor Wilson and we'll see if Councillor Nan arrives. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks to the mover. I just have a few background questions because I'm I'm not familiar of what um, preceded this time. Um, just so I understand, um, have we, in terms of the infrastructure that's there, uh, it's been over a, a year since I've been down there. Do we have a demarcation of the trail uh, of it um, going uh, one way and the other? Is it demarked? In the middle? No, it's no. there. Are, there are no lines. It's the same width as the waterfront trail in the west end, and I believe it's the same design standard as Gage Park. And so, as soon as you put the line down, you're back to enforcement. And so, it's the, a line has been suggested, and staff have advised against that because as soon as the line's down, there's an expectation that someone's enforcing bikes on one side, people on the other. And with the numbers that I just referenced, in terms of a half a million visits. Um, as soon as you take a bike portion out of the path, you leave less room for people and, uh, and other modes of transportation. And so there's, there wouldn't be enough room for those people to safely gather and use the trail in both directions with space taken out of the trail for cyclists. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, thanks. I'm not, not sure I, under, I do understand that because uh, I find, anyway, it's just a cue for users to, uh, it's also, you know, pedestrians and trail walkers uh, to try and keep to the pass on the left and uh, travel on the right. Um, just in terms of our overall summer student hire when it comes to say seasonal activities such as this, um, do we have a sense of um, what impact uh, COVID for example has had on that? those summer hires? I guess I'm trying to get a sense is, is this the exception or is, um, 
are we able to do our summer student hires for the kind of enforcement activity we're looking we normally do in the in the season okay i'm going to go to jeanette smith who reported on our student hiring uh, i think about uh, at the last meeting as i recall it that's, uh, refresh for me please yep um, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So we are still doing some summer hiring this year, um, but we're doing it through the lens of, are there staff that need to be redeployed because they do not have work to do? So they may be um, put into positions that were filled by students. Um, if there aren't anyone to redeploy, we have work that needs to be done. So Public Works has hired some students. There's been some challenges hiring students this year. Some, there's some, uh, we hear back, there's some fear with COVID around health and safety risks coming. Uh, some have applied for federal programs and so financially they're doing okay with those. Um, so there have been some challenges. Um, but where we need students and the general managers and their directors identify that, then we are hiring some. So could you could you refresh us on the numbers? Normally we would hire well, how many students and this year we're down to about a tenth of that, I think. I think so. Is Laura on the call? She's better at rhyming off the numbers um, yeah. than me. My, my memory, I, I recall 800 uh, students we would hire uh on an annualized basis i think as the number and this year we're up at about 100. that's what i thought 100 and 150 so it is right. quite a bit less yep but i can grab Sorry. that report laura far is not on the on the call but she we can we can get her to put some yep. specifics around that or i can Wilson. pull the report up and do that as well thanks jeanette um just uh on the point mr mayor that uh City Manager Smith just mentioned about the difficulty you're having attracting students because for reasons of fear and apprehension of what the action might entail. On on this one, what kind of safety provisions would be would be given to the students if they're on bikes and they're having to um, be in communication with others who are on uh, skateboards or bikes or or what have you. Um, how are we going to equip them so that when they're speaking to the uh, person who may be speeding, that they're in a safe yep. position? Yeah. I see. Uh, I see Ken. Ken on the line. So Ken, how are you going to manage this process? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, the students will be trained by uh, Adam Palmieri, who is a level five trainer for Can Bike. And uh, he is uh, he will train them in bicycle safety and, and how to uh, deal with uh, communications and tactical communications. Uh, the uh, the students will be equipped with the same equipment that our bylaw officer has. They they will have a mask, uh, uh, but also required to uh, to physical distance when when need be. But uh, they'll have the same equipment that our bylaw officers have and. Uh, is traditionally a law enforcement uh, based student that we hire for this project. And these are the students that are anxious to uh, get their foot in the door and get some some life, ex life experience so that they can move on to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thank you. That's a, a noble goal. And just again, as background, we were doing this previously or or not, this kind of enforcement on the waterfront trail. Okay. Through, through you, Mr. Mayor, we've never done uh, uh, a student ambassador program. Uh, we've mirrored this program similar to what we've done in Albion Falls, where uh, we we are encouraging people to uh, to enjoy the waterfront, but of course uh, do so safely. Uh, we've had to, to move to enforcement in certain times because certain people just don't want to abide by the rules. Uh, but by using a, a student as an ambassador with the capability of, of enforcement, it, uh, it it works both ways is it gives a great appearance for the city of Hamilton, but also it gives us the ability to correct behavior when need be. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Mayor. The Mr. Okay. Mayor, if I could jump in, Mr. Mayor, I have those numbers on the mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. and I, Mr. Mayor, I will say your memory is much better than mine. <laughs> so uh, we reported that in 2019, we hired 767 students and at the writing of that report, so it may have uh, changed a bit. We had 126 hired. Okay, there we go. Thank you.
And thank you, uh, thank you to Laura Fontana for that answer, Councillor Jackson. And we're on the uh, the item itself now. Uh, I see no further speakers. So on a move by Councillor Collins, second by Councillor Jackson. Uh, all in favor and uh, oppose, vote now. And sorry. Councillor Nan is, was not present, unfortunately, no. Okay, thank you. And that's carried unanimously for all that are present as well. And we are going to statement by members. And I'm gonna turn to Councillor Clark to start it off and we'll work up the, uh, we'll work around the horseshoe in reverse. Councillor Clark, you're up. Very kind of you, sir. I really appreciate that. Uh, I have one question for staff and then just one quick statement, if I may. Yes, um, can I ask through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. McKinnon, we have these, I call them candy canes. They're vents that come out of the sewer system on Upper Centennial Parkway, and they go all the way up into my friend and colleague, Councillor Johnson's uh, ward. Um, they have been emitting for the last few months some noxious and foul odors. Um, they kind of smell like rotten eggs sometimes, and other times they kind of smell like sewer gas, but I, I don't really understand how the mechanism is working these vents. Um, can I ask Mr. McKinnon if we're aware of this and what are we doing to resolve the issue? Because the residents have been complaining about the odors. General Manager McKinnon. And to you, Mr. Mayor. So we are aware of the issue. Our gang has been looking at that for the past many months. Uh, these uh, issues arose shortly after the uh, the trunk was commissioned. It's, it's actually not unusual uh, for a trunk sewer of that length and uh, uh, that design. Um, and when I say that design, it's we actually have a long force main that outlets into the gravity portion of the sewer. Further downstream, we have another gravity portion that outlets to a, a much lower gravity portion where there's quite a change in the uh, elevations. And so in both of those circumstances, you have a lot of the sewage that is being aerated and releasing odors. Uh, sometimes it's hard to anticipate with new construction how the uh, sewer is going to behave until you actually put it into service. And another complexity of this is, is it's also relative to the amount of development that is occurring upstream in Benbrook. So the more that uh, development comes on board, the, the better the uh, sewer will function. Uh, all, all of that to say that we're looking into it. Uh, we've got a study underway. Uh, for uh, I'm sure councillors uh, Collins and Marula will appreciate how difficult odors can be to track down and and uh, and to uh, to deal with, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, long trunk sewers. So uh, I guess the short that's the long answer. The short answer is yes, we're aware of it. We've been looking at it for several months. We've got a study underway to to, uh, to find out how we can uh, mitigate those odors and uh, try to relieve those residents of that unpleasant uh, experience that they're having up there. Well, I'd be happy to assist you with uh, verifying where the odors are coming from, because when I stick my head under the candy cane, you, you can smell it real fast. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it is disgusting. Uh, in this last heat wave, I had a lot of residents who were complaining they couldn't sit in the backyards because the air, as you know, it was kind of like almost like an air inversion. It was just sitting so heavy on, on the area and the air was not circulating and the odor was horrific. So can I get any indication of where we are in the study? You say you're studying it, but the odors are taking away the peaceful enjoyment of people's properties. And it's ironic, I finally get the odor shut down from the cannabis uh, farm that was in the area. Um, and now we have offletting gases from the sewer, from a municipal sewer that are causing just as much problem. Yeah. To you, Mr. Mayor, my understanding is that the study is uh, anticipated to conclude closer to the end of the summer, uh, which is probably not a, uh, the answer we're looking for. What I will do is go away with my operations team to see whether or not there's an opportunity to do some flushing in that sewer on a regular basis um, in a manner that won't inhibit the study, but will also try to bring some relief to the uh, residents in the area. I'll, uh, I'll actually have my team connect with you just to see where you're getting kind of your intel of where you're hearing the, uh, the worst of it. Yep, and uh, anything we can do to try to mitigate it in the meantime, because it, it, uh, until I experienced it, Mr. McKinnon, I, I didn't expect that type of odor to be coming from our own sewers 
uh, into the neighborhood. So I appreciate that. Um, and my statement um, for the neighbors, I, again, I, I'm very grateful to all of the residents for, who have been calling into my office and letting me know about issues in the ward. Uh, we've been incredibly busy these last few months and, and uh, in Ward 9, the residents are taking ownership of the ward and they're contacting Robert and I and letting us know where issues are because um, it's a large ward and we can't be everywhere and we're resolving those issues as quickly as we can as they're coming through. I do appreciate all the folks who have been wearing masks going uh, shopping. Um, I would encourage people to wear masks. Uh, they now have some new ones. I got this one from Pharmasave and it even has a PM 2.5 filter in it. Um, and it's washable and it's, uh, I mean, the cloth mask is washable, not the filter, obviously. Um, but we want to make sure that people are, are, are wearing the masks when they're out and about shopping. Um, because the proximity of that two meter range, Mr. Mayor, um, it's becoming a little bit nebulous at times. People are, are encroaching and if they're not wearing the masks, they're not protecting their neighbors and, and their friends. So I encourage people to wear the masks. Thank you very much, sir. Have a great day. Thank you. We uh, we certainly encourage the same. I think it's a wise choice for people and certainly a departure from where we've been, but uh, it's a new world right now in terms of uh, having to do some of these things that we would never have expected to do, uh, you know, three or four months ago. Uh, it's a new reality and I think uh, people wearing masks uh, is is to be laudable, not, uh, not to be criticized, but to be uh, applauded because I think it's the right thing to do. So thank you for that point. I'm going to go to Councillor Pearson. Yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, certainly agree with the wearing of masks where, uh, where at all possible. There are some residents that have health issues and can't wear them. Um, but I also want to just reiterate that residents in Ward 10, certainly for their patients, there are numerous issues as my council colleagues are all uh, busy. We're all working very hard in the ward and, um, and trying to keep up on outstanding issues and, and issues that are coming in. Uh, every minute. So I want to thank everybody for the patience. And I just another shout out. I'm having tremendous problems just as I'm hearing from other counselors around the table with regards to parks and play equipment. Please, please, please. I, I, it's so frustrating to keep having to send emails requesting that our staff go back out and try and, and put up tape. And I understand now Paul Johnson mentioned that signage is going up, <clears throat> but just it's for the safety of more than likely the little ones, which we have to be concerned of, that are now uh, evidence that they can also get COVID. So please, I'm encouraging residents to stay off of the play equipment at this time and um, recognize and, and be respectful and responsible as far as safe distancing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you very much, Councillor Johnson. Yep, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to, um, Councillor uh, Clark for bringing forward the odor issue because quite frankly, we have been complaining for the last eight months. So now I know that we just bring it to the horseshoe. I really appreciate it because it's been, it's been an ongoing um, situation and we just keep hearing the same thing over and over again. It's new, it's gonna be resolved, um, give us time. So I'm glad to hear that there's more things happening. And that was news to me. Anyways, um, I have just one announcement, Mr. Mayor, and it, sadly, it's uh, former deputy mayor and member of the Hamilton Wentworth region, Frank McIntyre, died in his oh. 92nd year. Uh, for those that don't know Frank, he was the founding member of the Glenbrook Rangers Junior C Hockey Club. He was involved with the Hamilton Conservation Authority, Glenbrook Minor Hockey Board of Directors, Knights of Columbus, uh, Children's Aid Society, and many more organizations. Uh, our condolences are with Lucy, his wife of 66 years, and their family. And in the 92 years, and if anybody knows Frank, I think that you'd totally get this. He had some very valuable lessons for all of us. First, lobster and cold beer are a great match. Weeds on your lawn are unacceptable. Take them out to the ball game. Stop and smell the roses. Keep your stick on the ice. Be kind to everyone. Get involved in your community. Never stop learning. Smiles are contagious. But family is most important gift you can have. So rest in peace, my friend. Thank you. Indeed, I'm surprised to hear that. I didn't know. And uh, he was a true gentleman. I said it was a pleasure to serve with him uh, on regional council uh, back in the day with Glenn Etherington, uh, you know, the former mayor. And uh, right. he was uh, he was one of those uh, gentle, gentle, but firm, uh, you know, wise individuals that uh, I looked up to uh, a fair bit. So uh, thank you for sharing that. And my condolences sure. go to the family as well. And I'm sure the family would just love to hear that. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. Well, he's a wonderful man. 
Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of things. First of all, uh, phase two opening was really uh, welcomed here in Ancaster. I see patios opening up everywhere and people getting out and enjoying themselves on, on these patios while remaining um, socially distanced. And uh, I still see very positive things in our grocery stores where everybody's keeping adequate uh, two meter distance, and you know, whether it's a grocery store or a hardware store or Canadian Tire or and so on. So it's been very well received. Unfortunately, though, the um, 170th anniversary or doing of the Ancaster Fair has been canceled. Uh, tens of thousands of people attend that event. It's probably one of the biggest events held in Ancaster annually, but because of the pandemic, their board of directors made the decision that they need to postpone it. And just, I understand it's only the second time in its 170 year history they've had to do this. So we got another great organization that's been uh, shut down because of the pandemic, but I think everybody understands why. And that's all I got. Yeah, very sad news indeed. Uh, they, among others, uh, all have, uh, you know, the Ancaster, all the fairs, quite frankly, I think are, are going to be uh, canceled. I, I think Brockton <coughs> did the same and the Peach Festival, yes. of course. And I think uh, I, we haven't heard, I'm not sure about Bimbrook. The, uh, I haven't Blair, heard of Bimbrook. Bimbrook. But uh, I suspect they'll be making a similar kind of call, but it's in their hands. But uh, yeah, tough decision to make, and uh, we're, we're certainly going to miss it this year. So thanks for sharing. Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have anything today. Okay, thank you. Councillor Whitehead is not with us. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I'm very pleased uh, to support and endorse an event that's being held this coming Saturday, June the 27th. It's a virtual online and it's called Dream It, Be It. And it is for young girls um, in grades nine to 12. It's a, they can register to get uh, important career information. Uh, there's resources, they can earn a certificate in uh, WIMIS or food handling, get it, uh, lots of advice from role models, which will be on a panel and learn ways to support their health in high school and, and much, much more. And they just need to register online and it's a free event and I will be posting it. It's on Facebook right now. We've just posted it from my office. And tomorrow I will be doing my video update for all my residents, which uh, I will be uh, talking about it more there. Um, I also want to thank my residents. You know, I mean, we've all been so very busy, but I, you know, I got to tell you <laughs> being in the rural area, uh, we've got rumors of hemp farms that are moving in around Carlisle um, and, and, and by law and, and the police and myself and building, we're, we're all getting uh, on top of all of this. We've had dump trucks moving fill. There's been, you know, 200 an hour and this has been happening for the past couple of weeks. So, you know, that's created a, a big issue. And if that weren't enough, um, there's some rural properties that are now with high powered rifles and they're firing them off in their, in their um, uh, back 40s. So we've got the police checking in on that as well. Um, but on, on a good news note, getting ready for our Canada Day celebrations and encouraging everyone to wear a mask. And my husband came home with this last night. So I just want to let everybody know that we do have our Canada Day masks and I encourage you to go out to uh, a lot of the, the local stores have them. This one is particularly from a, a watered down convenience store, but um, I'm definitely supportive of everyone wearing masks. Um, so I'll be wearing mine. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Councillor Danko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, with the summer weather officially here, um, all the splash pads in, in Ward 8 and throughout the city are now open. I, I believe they're all open now, uh, but the seven in, in Ward 8 are open along with our one outdoor pool. And the pool at uh, Westmount Recreation Center is scheduled to open on July the 6th. So there's some options for parents to uh, cool off with their kids and also um, get them the heck out of the house for a little bit. Uh, while at the same time, uh, when using those facilities, we're still insisting on physical separation, which is going to be uh, tricky and hope parents keep a close eye on their kids because we're still expecting them to stay that uh, six feet or two meters apart when they're using those facilities. Um, and secondly, I just want to uh, 
give a congratulations to all the 2020 graduates who are finishing up their studies and moving on. Um, my daughter's in grade eight. She's graduating this year. She's moving on to high school next year. And it's it's been, you know, difficult on her. And, and I, I think a lot of graduates that in this time, they're, they're not having that physical gathering where they get to celebrate in person and, and mark these important milestones. So, um, so you know, using this opportunity to uh, to congratulate all those those graduates and hopefully that uh, you know this is something they they might look back on in the future as hey, do you remember that time when we couldn't have our grad because of COVID? Uh, uh, maybe marking the, those uh, milestones in a different way, but uh, certainly good to uh, to celebrate them. Thank you. Absolutely, and I hope that they uh, they set another date because uh, you know no one should miss a graduation, and you know even if they do it a year from now, it'll be a great reunion. So they ought to schedule something that uh, will still celebrate their, whether it's grade eight or uh, grade twelve, that they uh, they set a date and still make it happen down the road because it's a, uh, it's a defining moment in all of our lives, I think, in many respects. So we hope that they continue to uh, celebrate that and find a way of doing it, even though it's delayed. But yes, that's congrats. Great. And I, you know, there's a local realtor that's cleverly uh, celebrated uh, graduates uh, throughout the city. And I see signs up all over the place, uh, you know, obviously the advertising the realtor, but at the same time, congratulating, congratulating the graduates, uh, you know, you know, in a, in a more dramatic way. I think that's very positive indeed. So good point. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, three quick announcements. Uh, number one, uh, great again to see uh, so many of the retail, restaurant, pubs, and uh, hospitality industries that are slowly uh, resurrecting and reopening and coming back into life after being in survival mode for about three and a half months. So I encourage um, constituents on the East Mountain to support the local neighborhood uh, restaurants, but also across the city. Secondly, Mr. Mayor, this month of June, is Filipino Independence Day celebration that usually occurs on June 12th. And again, because of the pandemic, I believe this has to be the first time in close to 40 years that the Filipino Independence Day will not occur at their community center, which is in the heart of Ward 3 there on King Street near the Delta. And always a great event with hundreds that turn out, uh, led by organizers uh, Zeni Misa and President Bonner Villabrosa, of the Hamilton Filipino Community Center. This month, they usually have gala awards, dinners, pageants, and uh, their Independence Day flag raising as well. And I've always been honored to be invited to that event. So never forgetting them and wanting to mention them today uh, during this council meeting. Congratulations to Filipino Independence Day. Since 1898, the country of the Philippines has been in existence, independent, and approximately 10,000 uh, people of Filipino origin that call Hamilton home. Lastly, Mr. Mayor, most importantly, I know there's been a lot of uh, protests recently across um, our country. Um, I never will support uh, violent protests. I do strongly support strong, peaceful protests as uh, Martin Luther King Jr. would have done, whose, whose poster is in my office and has been since I got elected. But I wanna say in spite of all this and the injustices of the past, Mr. Mayor, I wanna say happy 153rd birthday to the greatest country in the world being Canada. If it wasn't for this country and its open door policies over the last 80, 90, 100 years, families like my wife, Barbara Konietzki of Polish de descent and my Armenian family, the Tomajans and Ohanians would probably have not seen, uh, would not be alive today, would probably have lost their lives to persecution, to the Nazi regime for the Polish community and the Polish, uh, Polish nation, and to the Armenian nation at the hands of the Ottoman Turks and the first genocide of the last century. This great land of Canada and the governments of the last 80, 90, 100 years open their doors so that immigrant families like my wife's family and mine could come here, escape persecution, start a new way of life with just hope, dreams and hard works and nothing in their pockets and, uh, and just wanting to provide an opportunity for their family in their adopted new land. 
So Canada, in light of all the past injustices, and especially in light of any other country around the world, I say happy birthday, Canada, and I'm proud to be a Canadian of Armenian descent. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. And uh, for this uh, proud immigrant, I would second that emotion for sure. And I'd also say, uh, Councillor Jackson, stay with the gray. Just stay with the gray. It's fantastic. Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. One quick issue to bring up, and that is the uh, it's the 34th or was supposed to be the 34th year for the annual beach garage sale, which attracts thousands of people, depending on the weather. On that weekend, it's scheduled, it was scheduled for the second weekend in July, and I've received a number of inquiries from the beach community, including a formal request from the beach community council to get the word out that uh, the event is canceled. And so that was formerly the uh, Jimmy Lomax uh, annual Operation Santa Claus uh, parade, which has continued um, for many years after his passing. And uh, there is some discussion in the community, and I think in the in the broader Hamilton community, about the legalities around garage sales. And so I was hoping that Paul Johnson could provide uh, just a brief update in terms of the provincial regs, how they apply, and some of the issues that uh, people who are contemplating large garage sales, and I know this is probably the largest in the city, but for those contemplating events such as the one that has been cancelled, um, if we could get an understanding in terms of some of the risks that are involved with that. If I could, through you to, to Paul. Sure. Thank you. Through, you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, garage sales uh, are allowed in the stage two piece where we are there, they are allowed as, uh, as an activity. Uh, however, they can be subject to the up to 10 rule. Uh, they are a gathering of people and they also should take into account all of the public health safety measures to protect people and themselves. Um, right now where we are, they're not a particularly good idea. Uh, that would be the opinion of, of your emergency operations center. We have discussed in particular the large scale one, which we absolutely um, agree should uh, not proceed. And, and I understand our staff are working with uh, uh, with you and, and your residents to ensure that that large gathering event does not occur. But they're not particularly great ideas. Uh, it is really hard to control crowds. It's not set up as a retail space. And if you look at all the work that went into uh, even small retail locations for them to be ready to safely open, uh, I can't imagine a garage sale um, run in a community is going to have those types of measures in place. And so we would certainly encourage people to think twice about it. We're not yet at that stage where garage sales are a great idea, although not specifically uh, uh, prohibited as, a, as an activity. Um, they can be if they are gathering large numbers of people, uh, be, be contrary to that uh, rule that gathering should be less than 10 people. Thanks, Thank Paul. And uh, Mr. Mayor, you've been down there, so you, you'll know that uh, many of the city's vacant lots, as well as our parks, are used on that day by vendors who come from across the city and from outside of our borders, Grimsby and the, and the Toronto area. So we're getting the word out, and um, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware, as Paul mentioned, that uh, for, for gatherings such as the one that has that have been planned in the past on the beach for the beach community gar garage sale, you know, those events that attract uh, dozens, hundreds, and in this case, sometimes thousands of people um, are, are not a good idea at this point in time. So I wanted to get it out there in terms of trying to get some a little bit of advertising for them. They're, they are trying to get the word out. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Ken Leanders, who's, who's committed to having uh, bylaw staff go out to ensure that city properties are not used on that day. And I understand communication staff are preparing some um, information leaflets for the community council and the neighborhood to ensure that everyone's on the same page in that regard. So thanks for the opportunity to raise that today. Yeah, thank you. And we certainly encourage them to uh, think about next year and maybe doing a, doing a bigger and better one. But, uh, you know, that this year is probably not the right time to do this. So encourage them not to. Councilor Marula. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have one thing. Uh, June is the Italian Heritage Month in Canada. So I just want to uh, advise everyone of that and, uh, and applaud all the Italians that contributed to the great country of Canada. Thanks very much. The flag flies. Councillor Morello, it does Thank you, fly. Sir. Yes, sir. Councillor Nan. Can't, can't hear you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, two quick announcements. One, starting off with a big congratulations to the first ever graduating class, uh, any class graduating from um, Bernie Custis High School, secondary school. Um, they had their first year of uh, school and uh, what an interesting one nonetheless. And so this week there are many virtual celebrations going on, a lot of virtual recognition for all of the grads here in 
uh, going to school in Ward 3, but come from Ward 2, Ward 4, all across the lower city to come to Bernie Custis. And I just wanted to say congratulations to all the young people there. Also, uh, two weeks ago, we also celebrated the Cathedral High School grads and a big shout out to all of them as well, who've been doing an incredible job online of supporting each other and uh, profiling each other online virtually, which has been a great way to stay in touch with the students here in the community. And finally, uh, this Wednesday tonight at 8.30, 8, 8 p.m., we'll be hosting our fourth Ward 3 Wellness Wednesday. This is hosted through the Ward 3 office with self-care and wellness practitioners who are either live in the ward or have their businesses in the ward. And we have uh, movement coach Stilo Starr, who will be joining us this evening to lead everybody through a free virtual movement class and meditation class called Radical Rest and Self-Care available for any resident in Ward 3 and across Hamilton to join us on Facebook Live through the counselors page. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Farr. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask a question or two of Jason Thorne through you. Um, first off, Jay, uh, this is about our, our culinary scene support motion. Mr. Mayor, I moved it. You seconded it on May 13th. We were well ahead of any other uh, municipality across this province, and I think that served us well. And I just wanted to know how our pandemic patio program is going so far, Jay. Pandemic patio. That's interesting. The pandemic <laughs> patio program, the three P program, Jason. Mm -hmm. So, so through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I, I have to say the response has been pretty extraordinary. Um, we're well over a hundred inquiries um, since the program launched. Uh, really, I guess we're only talking about three weeks or so ago that we that we went live on the website and started formally taking in applications. Um, as of my latest update this morning, we've received um, seventy-seven applications. Um, a couple of those are still under review. Um, we have uh, 55 of those have already been approved. Um, our approval timeline is again, I think quite uh, quite good enough. Maybe give a shout out to the staff who are working on this. We're turning approvals around in actually less than a week. Um, so we are getting approvals out very quickly. Uh, like I said, of the 77 applications, we've got 55 approvals. We've had seven uh, that have been denied. Uh, and then we have a couple that are, that are still under review that have just come in in the past uh, day or two. And on those denials, Mr. Mayor, through you, the uh, final part of our motion, Mayor Fred, was that the city also support the establishment of temporary outdoor patios in the private parking areas of commercial plazas and malls where permitted by the applicable zoning. Is it that part that uh, for those seven, or most of those seven anyway, Jay, that's uh, become an issue and, and one that obviously has uh, confused our even our premier uh, with the question that obviously was posed by it looked like CHCH uh, yesterday and, and maybe maybe uh, this will help clear things up for the premier if he's watching too. So is it that zoning bylaw that uh, 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 doesn't permit uh, patios abutting residential. That's the issue. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's correct. For all seven that have been denied, it's it's the um, due to zoning and due to the same provision within the zoning. And what that provision states is that uh, for a side yard or a rear yard, they cannot be abutting residential. If it's in the front, it's not an issue. Uh, but if it's a side or rear yard that abuts up against residential, the zoning does not permit. Um, a patio, I, I should say, without going through the usual variance process where the neighbors would be notified, they'd have the opportunity to comment and so on, not our um, quick turnaround of, of four or five days. Right. Uh, you mean the Committee of Adjustment and Variance right. Process. So you're talking months. Do we have any idea when, we probably don't, but I should ask through you, Mr. Mayor, when the province might start letting these restaurants and bars bring people indoors uh, for what uh, I think uh, Councilor Marula might call a phase three. I, I, I've watched some uh, dialogue he's had with this issue recently. So um, do we know when that's happening? So at least some of these, especially these bigger establishments can start welcoming back uh, of the seven you've mentioned, welcoming back customers? So through you, Mr. Mayor, unfortunately, no, we don't have a have a timeline or date uh, that we're aware of that uh, that will be permitted. So, okay, okay, so they have one option through you, Mr. Mayor, to go through the variance. That's committee of adjustment. That's months. There's a big queue for that. Is there the special occasion permit option still, Jason? That that can be turned around a little quicker. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, that's correct. Um, special occasion permits have always been allowed. Um, and those can be turned around more quickly. 
Um, my understanding is that the province is uh, extending the liquor license permissions for those. Um, the only difference being that they are time limited. Um, so they are they would not be for an entire uh, summer uh, or, or and fall, which is what the outdoor dining district program envisages. Um, they are typically to a, a 14 day period uh, is the maximum, um, although that can be renewed um, if there aren't any uh, if there aren't any issues. Okay, really important point. Mr. Mayor, I might have jumped on you there. Did you want to? No, I think uh, the Premier indicated that I think sometime next week they're going to uh, uh, advise what phase three looks like, but they don't have a timeline as to when that might happen. So they're going to give us kind of parameter around what would open under phase three and what kind of requirements are going to be attached to it. But no, uh, no given timeline in terms of when that might happen. Okay. Well, I'm hopeful that uh, there'll be some considerations for these restaurants, particularly those that are unable to, at least at this point, take part. I hope uh, we get the message out. And I, I know in speaking with the staff that you've uh, deservedly given accolades to, Jason, Julia, uh, Sarah, uh, um, uh, uh, Tyler and others, they've done an, an amazing job and to have 50 out there now, I think that uh, speaks to the vision we had only about a month ago, a little more than a month ago. This is working. It was it was uh, smart overall. It's a major success. Uh, right now, uh, we hopefully can find some resolve for those seven and others that might come along that stumble into what was worded in the motion. We did uh, think ahead on this one that there may be occasions where we have zoning issues uh, as they may be a budding uh, residential and that's what all seven of the ones that have denied so far have had to uh, deal with so anyway hopefully they'll all go after a special occasion permit and hopefully that they'll, they'll work with their counselors in the immediate area and uh, there won't be any problems and those special occasion permits can be extended at least to the point where the province uh, makes things work indoors for those establishments I, I'm really very very pleased and I appreciate especially the work of Julia two of those seven establishments I've spoken to the upper uh, um, owner in the last 24 hours. I'll just close with this, Jay. And as much as they're disappointed that they can't participate at this point, and I'm trying to guide uh, appropriately, and you've just heard how, um, they have spoken great uh, accolades about Julia. They And, and considering that it, it's bad news that the staff is bringing, she's even good at bringing bad news. So I'm glad that we picked Julia Davis to front this, that you picked Julia Davis to front this program. That's all I have right now. I will uh, reiterate what we've been hearing uh, by my colleagues and yourself, Mr. Mayor. Well, let's wear our masks yep. wherever and whenever po possible and uh, stay safe, everybody. Yep, and let's keep uh, social distancing going and let's uh, not have inc uh, increased uh, cases of uh, COVID-19. And, and uh, the, the sooner that we do that, the quicker we can get to phase three where hopefully restaurants can open up Absolutely. and still some social distancing. Well, hopefully that's uh, not too far down the road. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you very much. Three quick points. Uh, tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. we have a virtual meeting with anyone who is interested in Ward 1 on the second phase of the Church Hill Park um, Master Plan. Uh, registration is required. You can go to maureenwilson.ca for how you can do that. And if you have difficulty doing that, please don't he hesitate to give us a call. Um, next Monday night is our second installment of our virtual book club, and we have local author and poet John Terpstra to speak to his book, Daylighting Shadok, and we'll have a conversation about, of course, that book, The History of Shadok Creek, um, and a discussion about the health and well-being of our urban waterways in general. Um, it's been touched on. Thirdly, uh, some of the graduations that are are not happening. I would just like to give a, a shout out um, to those young people who are so showing how, uh, even though they may be moving on from Hamilton, they are certainly heavy heavily invested in exercising their citizenship, um, and with a great clarity of purpose. Uh, we've been seeing that as of late. They're leading the discussion about racial justice, about um, environment, the environmental crisis that is beholds our planet. Uh, I just would like to thank them. Um, I'd like to wish them all well. And on a personal note, um, two out of three in our house are, are graduating, one from middle school and, and one from high school. And I'm particularly proud, of course, of, of my eldest who will be moving um, away and uh, how she um, conducts herself and I wish her very well 
and let her know that mommy is very, very proud of her. Thank you. Thank you very much. As as many, many parents are in the, throughout the community, you know what, it's, it's to me passing sad that they don't have a graduation this year, but it's uh, hopefully that again, that they'll, uh, they'll challenge themselves to do something uh, next year that will reflect on their previous school uh, school history. So hopefully then congratulations to all the kids out there that are graduating. Uh, I'm on my note, uh, happy to announce again that uh, the city of Hamilton is planning a celebration on Canada Day. So uh, on uh, thanks, thanks to RBC, uh, we're doing a one hour special on CHEH begins at 7 p.m. on July the 1st, Wednesday. Uh, it's gonna be uh, organized by uh, Sonic Onion and uh, many Juno award winning uh, artists will be performing that hour. And so we encourage people to tune in at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, July the 1st to help celebrate Canada Day in Hamilton, as well as the uh, door decorating challenge that uh, is happening throughout the city. So we encourage residents to decorate their doors and show their, their pride for, uh, for Canada. And uh, there will be uh, prizes for a best door uh, given out, uh, you know, after after that event, and uh, we'll look forward to celebrating Canada Day. And as Councillor Jackson pointed out, um, in my view, uh, and I think in the view of many, uh, Canada is uh, is that uh, that wonderful country that is blessed with diversity and blessed with the uh, the, the great immigration waves that have happened over the decades that uh, has made this a very spectacular, uh, enviable country in terms of our standard of living and our health care and all the things that we have are blessed by. Uh, I am forever grateful to be in Canada and I think uh, most Canadians would say the same thing. So uh, looking forward to uh, continuing to work on improving not only our Canada but our Ontario and our Hamilton. There's always room for improvement as always. Thank you all very much for your uh, comments and uh, I look forward to uh, celebrating Canada Day with all of you somehow. Uh, too bad we can't do it uh, in close proximity to one another, but we'll do it virtually one way or the other. And uh, I'm, I'm sure residents around the city will be celebrating as well. Uh, item 9-1 is the closed session minutes of June the 3rd, 2020. I, I'm, I'm going to suspect that there, aren't, there isn't any discussion on it, because if there is, we have to go into camera. So can I have a motion to approve the minutes of uh, June the 30th, 2020, moved by Partridge, seconded by Johnson. All in favor? The electronic vote. Thank you. Councillor Wilson and Nan are giving me thumbs up both. Thank you. I think she has what she needs. And on the confirming bylaw, Councillor Jackson, a motion on bills, please. Councillor Jackson. Mr. Mayor, moved by myself, seconded by Ward 5 Councillor Chad Collins, that the June 24, 2020 bills be passed, that the corporate seal be affixed thereto. And it's simply now, Mr. Mayor, awaits your famous signature and that of the city clerk, Adria Holland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's the favorite part of my meeting is to sign all those wonderful bills. Thank you so much. Any discussions on the bills? Seeing none, thank you. All in favor? Votes already there. Promptly and efficiently. And on that note, which I assume will be unanimous support. Councillor Ferguson, thumbs up. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's approved. And I will take a motion to adjourn. Moved by Marula, seconded by Councilor Ferguson. Do you want to say something? No? Okay. Um, moved, moved and seconded. Moved and seconded. Sorry, people are all waving. I'm not sure if you're waving to get my attention or you're waving goodbye. Oh. Thank you all. All right, have a great meeting. Thank you all, great meeting. Motion to adjourn, moved and seconded, everybody waved, all in favor, carried. Thank you. Have a great weekend, or week. <laughs> We're not even close to weekend yet. Sorry.
sorry. We need it. We need a yes vote. Okay. Why is my yes vote not going through? There we go. It doesn't want to stop. Yeah, I don't want to stop. I want to carry on. Councillor Ferguson, his thumbs up. Yep, Councillor Nance, thumbs up. Councillor Collins, not sure he's still on the call. Yeah, I think he's actually he's definitely exiting in the building. We can watch him leaving now. Yes. All good. Thank you all very much. See you next time. See you soon.